everyone. My name is Lori and I'm with DXO. I'm here with Dan Hughes and you are watching Discover the New, Even More Powerful Capabilities of Viewpoint Technology in NIC Collection 5. We're very excited to have you here with us today. Dan actually is a Chair of Photographic Sciences undergraduate program director at RIT, which is Rochester Institute of Technology. Dan and I worked together at Nick Software many years ago for quite a few years in the education department, uh, doing webinars and such. So he is uh, doing webinars monthly with DXO, which is fantastic, gives me an opportunity to catch up with Dan. So he's just fantastic. He knows all the ins and outs of the Nick Software and so you'll be able to really gain some, hopefully some great tips and techniques with him today. And of course, he's talking about one of our favorite subjects, which is control points. That's the magic of Nick's software. So I know that you're going to enjoy this. So sit back and relax. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for presenting this and we look forward to a great webinar. My pleasure. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for the really sweet um, introduction there. Uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we are talking about U-Point technology, you know, the way that I refer to them, at least during the webinars, utilizing control points, which is um, one of the most powerful facets of the NIC collection, at least in my mind, um, because it opens up the opportunity to selectively adjust or target particular objects or areas and control what's happening to those objects or areas. And um, in fact, the control points have been newly updated for Silver FX Pro, uh, Viveza, Color FX, and Analog FX. So let's talk about it. Let's take a look. In fact, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this slide out, which, by the way, if you if you don't already have the software, uh, there's a great demo. You can download it and use it. It's fully functional. Um, you can utilize that for the um, demo amount of time. And uh, from there, you can pick up the software using that link uh, that was in the previous slide and will also be shared in the uh, follow-up email as well. So this is what we're talking about today. We are going to, I'm going to cover basically what control points are, and then we're going to talk about all of these new updates. So we have the ability to rename control points. Uh, we can save them as and within presets um, so that we can apply them to multiple images if that's helpful and useful. A lot of times that can be. Um, we can enjoy a refined and minimal interface, right? So there's been a simplified interface so that the tools palette is only really on the right side of our NIC collection tool. And then um, we can control, and, and in my mind, this is uh, my favorite part, uh, we can actually control the sensitivity of our control points now in a different way than we could before. So let's, let's talk about all of those things. And I'm gonna close this slide and uh, we're gonna we're gonna start out on this photograph um, from Moab, uh, specifically from um, Arches National Park in uh, Utah. Now, um, I am utilizing the Nick collection from Photoshop here, and I am on a Mac, and I'm just gonna point that out. Um, and in Photoshop, you do have the ability to utilize this uh, Nick selective tool. It's a really handy way of accessing the software and it enables you to do some some different things um, in terms of accessing favorite presets or favorite um, recipes and so on. But that's not what we're here to talk about so much. We're here to talk about control points. And um, everything that we're going to get into today, we're within the NIC tool and therefore will um, translate into any of the ways that you might be launching into Viveza, whether you're on a Mac or PC, or you're launching from Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever. So uh, let's go ahead and open up Viveza. And uh, the first thing that I wanna do here is give you an overview on how control points work, at least for the most part. Uh, so we'll, we'll do this on two images where I'll kind of just walk you through uh, what these control points can can do for us, basically. And then we're gonna go in depth into the, the tools palette and um, the adjustments. So we're here in Viveza. Uh, follow my cursor over to the far right side of the interface. We're gonna move into the selective adjustments section, and we're gonna click on the uh, control points button over here on the right side. So as I click on the control point button, uh, this is basically gonna allow us to uh, click on an object or on an area 
and it will leave the control point on whatever we click on. So uh, here I've dropped the control point on the sky, and we've got a couple options here. We can, of course, place the control point in different areas on the sky, and uh, or on the, the stone face itself. Um, and, and basically, depending upon where you place the point, you will get a slightly different selection, right? And what this control point is doing is it's making a selection of the object that you've placed the point on, and it's making that selection inside of the circle, basically. Now, it's not making a circular selection. It's actually making a selection inside of the circle of the thing that you place the point on, which is based upon the tone and colors and textures that are within that tolerance of the control point, basically, right? And in fact, um, I placed the point, I've clicked on the sort of area of influence slider. Sorry, let me just show you this. This is the area of influence slider. It allows you to uh, make the control point bigger or smaller. Um, and once you've placed the point on the object, Basically, that's all you have to do most of the time. You can then just move over onto your tools palette on the right side and start making your adjustments. So I can maybe um, darken the sky down a little bit, you know, maybe add in a little bit of structure, which is going to enhance the texture, the, the difference between the blue of the sky and the clouds within the sky. Um, and then, you know, maybe I want to add a little extra blue. So I'll move on the right hand side in my tools panel over to the blue slider and I'll just increase the blue a little. Right. In general, that's how control points work. You place the point on the object, it makes the selection of the object, and then you make the adjustments you want. That's the beauty of U point technology. You just point at the thing and it makes the selection. It's really quite nice. And it goes a lot further than that. But if you've never tried control points before, that this is the first way to do it. You just place the point on the object and use it. Uh, it's really quite fascinating and nice and simple. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about how these control points are making their selections. And I think uh, the best approach for that is to look at the selection that this control point is making. So follow my cursor back over to the right-hand side. We're gonna move into the selective adjustments section. So I'll just go ahead and uh, enlarge that there on the right side. And um, in, in your control points list, which right now we just have one control point, but uh, we're gonna ultimately have more than one. We'll have several in here. Um, you can do a couple things. First of all, if you move over to the far right side, you can turn uh, the control point on and off. So you can see if I click that little checkbox, that's going to hide the effect. So you don't see the adjustment being made on our image. And then if I click that little checkbox again, you're gonna see that turn back on over there. Cool, that's how you can see what the control point is doing visually. If you ever want to see what the control point is making a selection of, um, let me just click here. You, you move over to that right-hand side, and I'm going to use the function button here, and you click on this little square that has the circle in it. And this is going to kind of enable the mask that's being selected. So if I click on that, um, this is giving us an idea of what we're making our selection of. Let's talk a little bit about this. So we place the point on the sky. It's making a selection of the tone, colors, and textures that we place the point on. And what you're seeing is anything that is white is being affected by this control point completely. Anything that's black, like the stone face here, is not being affected by the control point, right? So we can see that uh, that control point is affecting the sky, but it's not affecting our rocks. Now, um, the shades of gray, allow us to make this very photographic looking, very clean kind of selection, right? So you can cut stuff out using different kinds of selection editing tools, right? You can literally, you know, take a lasso tool in some pieces of software, cut it out, and you're going to uh, make adjustments that way. That's fine, that's cool, it works well. Um, this kind of selection is, is pretty intuitive. Once you get used to it, you place the point, it does the thing for you. But then you can also control how it's making its selection um, based upon where you place the point. So if I click on our point and I start to drag it around, you'll actually see a live preview of how the selection is changing, right? And so as I take my mouse and I drag it over the sky, it does a great job to you know, really only affect the sky. Now, if I drag the control point over our rock face here, now we're not making a selection of the sky, we're making a selection of the rock face, 
So you can kind of get an idea of what's going to be affected based upon where you place the point. And this becomes really important to, to you know, be able to enable using that box on the right side, which we're gonna continue to talk about throughout the webinar. Um, and also it, it gives you an idea of, you know, what, what's gonna happen when you adjust your image. Now, I think once you get really used to utilizing the control points, you, you'll find that you probably don't even need to turn this mask on all that often. Um, I, I find that I don't actually click on that little box over on that far right side. I, I actually just place the point on the object, make my adjustment, and then turn it off and on a couple times to make sure that it's adjusting the way I want it to, right? So I'm just clicking on the little check box that's on that far right hand side. Now, I like what's happening to this um, sky here. I kind of want the uh, control point to adjust other parts of the sky. We can do that two ways, really. Actually do a couple more ways than that, but we can do it basically two ways. We can take this area of influence and we can expand that out. And that's basically indicating to the software that we want this control point to reach further out from that center point. Um, or we could actually uh, duplicate a control point. So let's say I wanted my control point to be a little bit smaller, maybe this size. And then I wanted to have an, uh, an exact duplicate over here on the right-hand side uh, within our sky. What, what I'm gonna do is hold the Option key down on my Mac, it would be Alt on a PC. And as you hold the Option key on your Mac or Alt on a PC, you click on the point you wanna duplicate and you just drag away a duplicated control point, right? And so now what we've got is an exact duplicate of our original control point, voila, great. Now we've got the same adjustments happening there in those two different areas. Um, now, both of these control points, if you follow my cursor over to the right-hand side, probably could use a name, right? Uh, like in this case, uh, control point one, maybe I'll go ahead and rename that to be sky, left side of image or sky left, right? So I'll go ahead and do that, sky left. And I'm gonna do the same thing to control point two, but I'm gonna name it sky right. Uh, to do that, you double click on the name of the control point in the control point list. So I'm over here on the right side, I double click on where it says control point two, and I'll just say sky right. Cool, now I've got a good name for that. Now, um, some of the naming, it, you know, it's entirely up to you as to how you might uh, name these different things. Um, a lot of times I, I find myself uh, naming like the tones. For example, in this image, I've got uh, two different textures of the stone here, of the rock, right? I've got this area, which is a little bit warmer, a little bit more orange, and I've got this area, which isn't so much, right? So in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and name this control point um, the, you know, more warm stone, warm red rock. And then I'll go to my control point four, oops, I double clicked. There we go. Cooler red rock. Nice. Okay, so I've got my control points here. Um, in this case, I'm just gonna add a little more blue uh, to that sort of stone and a little bit more contrast. And then I'm just gonna enlarge that control points area of influence. Oops, there we go. Enlarge that. I think I've actually added too much blue, but I'll show you how to fix that a little bit. Um, now with our warmer stone, I'm gonna go ahead and um, amplify that a little bit. So I'll move over into our uh, adjustment tools and I'm just gonna warm that area. And in fact, I think that's really all I need to do on this image in this case, uh, to create a little bit of contrast between the warmer uh, rock face and the area that has um, a little less of the, the wear and tear on it there. So uh, long story short, that is, how do you use control points? We're within Viveza um, right now, uh, but that's how you'd approach utilizing control points in the, in the basic sort of way. That, that is, you place the point on the object, you go in and you make your adjustments. Now, um, deciding what sort of adjustments you wanna make to your image is a whole other conversation, um, but that's how you use control points. Place it on the object, make your adjustments, and then you know refine your selection. Let's talk about refining our selections a little more. So I'm gonna move into the lower right corner of the interface and click the apply button. Um, as that applies, it's gonna go back over into Photoshop. 
we have um, a duplicated layer of pixels and then the adjustment is applied to that duplicated layer. So you can see the before and the after. All right, so our next image is uh, not so photographic, but will help to drive home these control point selections. So um, the rest of our images that we'll look at aside from this one are photos. They are not just images made in Photoshop here. Um, but, but this is a good way in my mind to talk about how these selections are being made and talk a little bit of, uh, about uh, um, how to refine those selections. So I went ahead and just launched right into Viveza 3 and uh, let's continue our conversation about utilizing these control points. So I'm going to click on the control points button on the right side of the interface here and I'm just going to let's place a point on the star. Right, so I've placed a point on that blue star right there. Let's just look at the selection that's being made. So we go over to the right side of the interface, click onto our um, mask show button, so we can show or hide the mask. Um, you know, if we click on our control point, you can see as the selection changes, it's it's cognizant of the edge of the star there. As soon as I go over the edge, you can get a good idea of what the control point's making its selection of. Now. Right now, I am not technically selecting out my star completely. And I know that because it's white in the middle of the star, and then there's this nice fall off towards the edge. Um, and that's super handy to have in a lot of situations. This is one of the ways that we are creating this photographic looking selection and then therefore photographic looking adjustment as we make our adjustments, you know, utilizing the tools palette on the right. Uh, now, as I click on my control point here, if I expand this out, I can kind of get a little bit more of a cutout of the star. If I bring this back in just a little bit, um, let's let's talk about the um, luminance and chrominance sliders. I, the, actually, on this object, let's turn off the control point for just a second. We're going to turn off our mask. On on this control point, because we're making a selection of a solid color. And there's really no difference um, between you know this pixel here and these pixels over here. Um, our new color selectivity adjustment tools aren't going to do all of that much for us. So I want to show you what happens if you use control points like this using these new tools, luminance and chrominance. I also want to show you um, you know kind of more where I find the new tools of the luminance and chrominance color selectivity option uh, really comes into play. So I've taken another control point. I've placed it in this little cyan gradient in the lower sort of right quadrant of our image here. Um, let's turn on our selection. So follow me to the right side of the interface. Let's go ahead and check that on. And um, as I you know, take a look at this selection, if I click on it and drag it, you can see what's happening with our selection. Now I'm gonna place it right in the middle of that gradient, there's a cyan gradient right there. And um, I want to start talking about these color selectivity adjustment sliders. So in the past with um, other NIC plugins, uh, the, the previous versions of the software did not have the luminance or chrominance sliders. What they had was the ability to place a control point, size the control point, and then also use what's called a constricting control point. Because as you add more and more control points, each control point can kind of get smarter and understand exactly what it should be selecting. Because this control point is selecting the star here, this control point is selecting um, our gradient down here, and they can kind of talk to each other, if you will. Now, the, the new capabilities here, if I click on my control point to activate it, which by the way, um, to know if a control point is the current or is a current activated control point, it will be highlighted in gold or that sort of orange color there. Whereas um, the non-active control point you can see up here in our star is, is, is white. It's um, a non-active point. All right, so um, we've activated our control point on the gradient. We're gonna move over into our luminance slider. And we will talk about this a couple more times throughout the webinar because there's some different things that you can do with the luminance and chrominance slider 
but suffice it to say, it adds more control for the user as to what's being selected. If you go to this luminance slider and you drag the luminance slider uh, to the left, we are going to be making a sort of less selective adjustment. You didn't see it change all that much there on this example, but um, if you slide the luminance slider to the left, what's happening is we are um, we are making a, a less sensitive selection. Whereas if we take the luminance slider and we drag it to the right, what's happening is we're tightening down the tolerance for the brightness level, the luminance value of what we're adjusting, right? So if I want a more precise control point based upon the brightness of the object that we've placed it on, you're gonna slide that luminance slider to the right. If you want more of a broad selection, you're gonna slide that luminance slider to the left, right? So this is a way to control how the selection is being made based upon the brightness. Your chrominance slider does exactly the same thing, except it's not paying attention to the brightness, it's paying attention to the chroma, the chrominance, the, the amount of color and the color itself. So if you take this chrominance slider to the right, we're making a more precise selection. If you slide it to the left, we are making a, um, a less sensitive, sort of more broad kind of selection. Um, and this is going to ring true, and it's going to offer really interesting capabilities on different kinds of images. In this case, we just have our uh, cyan gradient here. And in fact, one thing that might be interesting, it's an active control point. Maybe I didn't want this area of the image to be cyan anymore. Um, what I would do is go into my red slider and just start to add some red, right? And at some point it basically neutralizes. And if I take it too far, it's gonna become red, right? So that, that works really nicely. But let's say I had a, um, a color cast in my image and I needed to get rid of some of that color cast. Well, I could go and place my control point, adjust the colors to, you know, to get rid of that color cast, utilizing the red, green, and blue slider and maybe warmth. Um, and then the beauty of the, the luminance and chrominance adjustments is this is gonna allow us to kind of reach further out by making a more broad selection, or if we needed it to be a little bit more precise, we could maybe not reach so far out. And this is, this is a relatively subtle uh, change. I probably, I'll just push it a little bit further so that it's easier to see. The, the problem with this is it's not really a photograph, right? So um, it's harder to kind of get a good sense of what's happening. But that's how the luminance and the chrominance options work. Let's click the cancel button here. And let's move into um, a photograph. So I'm gonna move into the next image here, which is a, just a sort of a simple snapshot image. It's, it's a, a complicated or complex image compared to our Arches National Park image. But let's talk about control points within Viveza on this snapshot. So we'll click on Viveza. Uh, as that launches, uh, my friend in the middle there has a, has a hat on and that's blocking some of the light on her face. So I definitely wanna bring out some of the light on her face. Um, I also wanna minimize some of the distractions in the background um, while still allowing us as viewers to kind of understand the context of the image. This is a street in New Orleans. Uh, we've got uh, the, you know, these three friends here getting this photograph right in the middle of, of the street. And this isn't an image that I wanna spend hours on, you know, making adjustments to, but it's a great photograph of, of my three friends here. And so I wanna be able to share it with them and to show that I'm a better photographer than what I really am, maybe. I'm gonna make some adjustments in post-processing. Now, that's not the case in all situations. Sometimes, um, you know, you can only capture the image so well based upon the lighting conditions and based upon what's happening in front of the camera and so on and so forth. And then the software is an aid to make things even better. In this case, I wanted to clean up some of my, uh, you know, maybe mistakes, um, which is placing them exactly where I placed them when I shot the image and um, not suggesting that my friend Carolyn remove her hat or something. Anyways, let's go to the control points on the right side. Let's start in the sky here. Right, and we're gonna make our most kind of dramatic adjustment to the sky. The sky is practically blown out. It was a, it was sort of a foggy, hazy, hot day. Um, and this is relatively common in a lot of situations. So I'm gonna go and place my control point. I'm gonna go and actually 
take my brightness level down, darken it down quite a bit, probably more than, it, than I want. In fact, if I take it too far down, the, the sky sort of inverts and it looks really funky, really strange. So I don't want to take it that far down. But if I take it maybe to 40% or something to get a little bit of density in there, and then I go into my blue slider and I just add a little bit of blue, and maybe go into my red slider and remove a little bit of red, I'm going to get you know a nice kind of cyan sky. I'll, it would be difficult to make a full blue sky without doing like a sky swap, which is you know something that you could do in other um, tools. In this case, I think it's best to not. So I'm just going to go ahead and darken that sky down just a touch. Now, as I make those adjustments, it's highly likely that I'm going to also be adjusting Carolyn's shirt and um, Aaron's shorts, right? So what I want to do to correct anything that that control point might be adjusting that I don't want adjusted. So I'm going to take another point, place it on Carolyn, take another point, place it on Aaron. And what these points are going to do is kind of claim their own territory, if you will. The, the control points are going to look at the object that they're being placed on and they will make their own selection. And in fact, let's push this a little bit further. I'm gonna take my exposure down too far, but watch this. If I take my control point off of Carolyn's shirt, you can actually see it sort of gets a lot darker. And that's because the sky control point thinks that it should be adjusting this, right? So we've already talked about how the luminance and chrominance slider works but this is actually another really powerful way to make sure that each control point is making the selection that we want it to make. Now we are going to go a little bit further in, in depth with the chrominance and um, luminance sliders. And I think in this case, we, we don't really need to. We can just use this sort of old fashioned constrictive control point sort of adjustments um, by placing the points on the objects where we want to adjust. And in fact, because I don't want to spend much time you know, sort of in real life, making adjustments to this image. I'm gonna just um, very quickly make some adjustments, oops, as I hold the option key down, um, and darken that down, maybe place a point here, and we'll just minimize our distractions and kind of maximize um, our subjects by drawing your attention into the subjects a little bit more, right? And I'm doing that in this case, by darkening down the things I don't want you to look at and by brightening up the things I do want you to look at. So I'll dodge Carolyn's face just a little bit and we'll burn down or darken down a little bit of the background back here. And you know we could spend five more minutes and really start placing points on everything. I think this little bag of garbage on the left side should probably just get cloned out because it's not useful for the composition, but um, that's not what we're doing right now. We're talking about control points. So here are control points on our snapshot image utilizing Viveza. Let's take a look at the before and after. Here's the original image, you know, cute picture of my friends. And then here's our enhanced image, just subtly adjusted where we're directing the viewer's attention in towards our subjects. We're going to click the apply button. It brings us back over into Photoshop. And I think if we hadn't walked through each of those different facets and what those control points are doing, we probably could have made those adjustments in less than a minute, right? Which is really quite wonderful, um, especially if you've got a lot of different kinds of images that you're making adjustments to, or you go on a trip or you go, um, you know, there's a family reunion or whatever, uh, you know, you need to make a lot of adjustments to a lot of images. This kind of software is very easy to utilize that for. In fact, we didn't even talk about creating a preset within uh, Viveza, which you absolutely can do. Let's talk about um, control points within Color Effects Pro, and I'll show you how you can actually utilize uh, recipes with saving control points, right? Which basically means if you've got multiple images where you want to apply the same stack of filters, the same look, um, and you also want control points to be applied to those looks, uh, you can actually save recipes and presets from other pieces of software, from other of the Nick collection rather, um, utilizing this same kind of technique. Now, we've opened up Color Effects Pro on our flower image. Our control points are going to have those same kinds of capabilities. We're gonna have our chrominance and our luminance sliders. And in Color Effects Pro, we have the ability to uh, put a filter in on an image using control points, 
or remove or reduce the amount a filter is going to be applied to the image. So in this case, I'm gonna just do an overall pro contrast adjustment. So I've, I've on the left side added pro contrast. By the way, anyone who's not familiar with Color Effects Pro, uh, this is a collection of 55 individual filters. Each of the different filters are designed to do different things. The pro contrast filter, the one that I'm manipulating over here on the right side of the interface, is designed to enhance and correct any kind of contrasts or maladies or problems. If we look at the before and after, so I just checked this little checkbox on, and or off rather, I'll turn it back on here, um, you, you'll see the adjustment being applied. Right, so now we've got uh, we've got fuego, we've got fire here. This is this image has a lot more depth to it, a lot more pop. Um, now I don't know if we need any control points in this case. There's the before, there's the after. Sort of assessing the image, I don't I don't think we really do need much of anything in there. But uh, the next filter that I want to apply to this image, bleach bypass. I definitely want to uh, control exactly where I'm putting and exactly how much of the effect I'm putting in. Uh, because this bleach bypass filter, as I click the add button over here on the left side of the interface, it's going to add our bleach bypass filter. It is going to highly manipulate the image. And um, oftentimes when we click on these filters, uh, it's hard to get a sense it, you, it's obvious to get a sense of what's going to happen with this filter, but maybe it's hard to get a sense of sort of some of the subtleties or the nuance that you can add to an image um, if that's the goal. And in this case, Bleach Bypass does this really great job of increasing localized contrast, increasing textures. Um, but right off the bat, maybe it doesn't work on every single image. And, and here at the default settings, I don't think it does. Uh, what I want to do is zero out my saturation. So if you follow me to the right side of the interface here, I'm just going to make some adjustments uh, to the overall filter, right? So I'm reducing the contrast and I'm going to bring my local contrast all the way down to zero. And let's just see what this does. So I've kind of reduced all of the adjustments here to their minimum. So there's still a little bit of a contrast bump um, and what I want to do is start to increase my local contrast. But as I bring this up to 56, halfway to 100 there practically, um, you know, overall, this is way too strong of an effect. And that might work in a lot of situations, but in my mind right now, it's not working for this image. But I love what's happening to some of these petals in here. And I really just want the filter to be applied to some of those areas within the petals. So this is where we move into our control points. And here within color effects, we have plus and minus control points, right? So um, a plus control point is going to tell the software that this is where we want the effect. And a minus control point is just going to remove the effect. Now, if I start with a plus control point, watch what happens. So I'm gonna click the plus control point button. I'm gonna go place the plus control point on the area that I want the filter to be applied to. And by placing the plus control point like that first, so you know, a second ago, we had our bleach bypass filter was being applied to the entire image. Now we only have the bleach bypass filter applied to that one section, right? That one area with, uh, you know, that I've placed the point on. Now, if I click on my control point, I start dragging it around, I can see what would happen. I can kind of get an idea of the potential of uh, what we're getting here. And I love what's happening right here in the middle, just a relatively subtle effect. If this was still too strong, like maybe you like it overall, but maybe it's too strong um, just for that one control point, uh, what you can do is move over to the right side here. and you can control the strength slash the opacity of each control point. So I'm just gonna rename this control point to be uh, Petal Detail, right? And um, that's gonna be this control point. Oops, I need to activate it, there we go. And from there, I can move into my opacity slider and I can just bring this up or down, right? So I can actually control the exact amount of the opacity that I want using this, con this plus control point or a minus control point. Technically, they're the same. Um, 
It's just the default setting of the opacity that's different. Meaning, if I take a minus control point and I place it over here on this pedal on the far right side, what you'll notice is that the opacity of control point number two is at zero. You can always drag that up and place it at whatever percentage makes sense or works um, for that particular object or area. So I place a plus control point here. The opacity over on the right side is going to be at 100%. I'm just going to drag that down a little bit. Now, that's the basic use of control points here within color effects, of course. Um, and then we can go our you know, further steps to control the exact selection and adjustments that we're getting um, out of the control point using our luminance and chrominance. So let's do that. I'm going to go to my pedal detail control point. Let's turn on our um, selection. So I click on my little uh, rectangle. It's got the circle on it in our control points list show or hide selection um, option. And um, this is a better image to really get a feel for what our color selectivity um, and luminance selectivity sliders do. If I take my luminance slider and I slide it to the right, what I'm doing is I'm telling the software that I only want the control point to be affecting these very specific luminosities, the, the brightness levels, right? Whereas if I drag it to the left, you can see I'm going to get more of a softer kind of gradiated sort of selection. Um, now, sometimes you want a more precise selection, whereas other times maybe um, just a gradient would be useful, right? And in fact, yeah, what if we wanted just a gradient, you just take your luminance slider and your chrominance slider to the left, and now we're just kind of getting this circular gradient, which can be very, very useful in a lot of situations. I think in our case here, let's turn our mask off. In our case here, I don't think that the luminance and chrominance set that way is gonna be helpful. I actually want to be much more precise um, with exactly where my selection and then therefore adjustment is being made um, so that I can kind of bring out those little textures in a nuanced way without you know, kind of hitting you in the head with this bleach bypass filter effect. Um, whereas with other images and other control points, other um, applications of filters, it might be more useful to just have a gradient in the corner or something. Um, long story short, we've got two filters on our image here. So if you follow me to the right side, we're using Pro Contrast and Bleach Bypass. And with the Bleach Bypass filter, we've used three control points. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to save this as a recipe this is actually a very common combination of filters that I use on all sorts of different kinds of photos because Pro Contrast does a great job to correct contrast. And then Bleach Bypass allows me to sort of, you know, direct the viewer's attention by adding texture, by adding contrast or local contrast into some different areas within the image, even if I'm doing it in a very subtle way. So let's say we like this combination of filters. We want to save it as our custom preset. What you'll do is you move into the lower uh, right corner of our the Vesa, I'm sorry, this is color effects of our color effects. Uh, click the save preset button, and then I'm gonna name this uh, Pro Contrast with Detail uh, Bleach Bypass. Because it's a pretty specific application of bleach bypass. It's really just to bring out those textures. And then I have my checkbox here, which allows me to save control points. So in a lot of situations, might not want to save control points because a control point is completely specific to the image that you're putting it on. But in other situations, it's probably very useful to have that checkbox on so the next time you apply this preset, I'm going to click save, um, it has those uh, control points saved into them. Now I click the save button and then if you look over on the far left side, you can see our pro contrast with detail bleach bypass. It has been saved into our custom into our custom um, filters here, custom presets rather. All right, I like what's happening here. I'm gonna click the apply button. Let's keep moving. So I wanna show you uh, the, the same controls, but within Silver Effects Pro, which is, is of course the premier black and white conversion software uh, here within our Nick collection. So let's jump over into this portrait. We're gonna go right into Silver Effects. Um, what you're, what you're hopefully getting out of this is that the control points in each of the diff different pieces of software 
control different things, meaning in Viveza, you have control over light and color. In color effects, you have control over the individual filter that you're applying at that time. Here within Silver Effects Pro 3, uh, you have this really powerful set of black and white tools, and you can control a lot of those tools using control points. But once you learn how the control points are making their selections, and once you learn how to sort of navigate the different facets of how you know, they kind of come together and work with all of these different um, sort of additional features that are within the newest version of the software here, uh, you can utilize the control points within any of the NIC suite. All right, so we've got Mabel here. You know, there, I don't really have much to show you in this image um, as, aside from maybe some control point adjustments, right? So I've zoomed in a couple times. I'm going to place a control point here on her eye. I'm going to delete that second one. I don't need it. And I'm going to just size my area of influence. And actually, you know what? I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. Let's let's take a look at how these um, adjustments are going to we're going to decide what we're going to do to the image based upon how the selection tool, our control point, makes its selection, right? So I've placed this rather large control point on her eye. If I move over to the right-hand side where I have control over our selective adjustments, our control points, I can move my brightness slider to the right. I can add maybe a little bit of structure in. Structure is a um, enhancing the texture that are, you know, basically increasing um, Oh, it's almost like sharpening, but it's not exactly the same thing as edge sharpening. It's looking for these little detail areas to enhance them. Um, now, I've increased brightness, increased contrast, increased structure, probably too much. If we look at the before and after, you see the before and the after just with that control point applied to it. Uh, but it might not be making the exact selection that we want. So. Let's move into our selective adjustments section. Let's click on our mask so we can see what's happening here. And you can see it's making a you know pretty nice selection overall. Uh, it's just maybe a little bit too big. So I'm gonna resize my area of influence. Um, and then from there, it's still not doing exactly what we need it to do. So we've got a couple options. We can actually technically add more control points. So watch this as I, I'm gonna turn off control point one selection. I'm going to add another control point just into this sort of shadow area next to her eye. Watch what happens to the shadow section next to her eye as I place this point. You'll actually see it, it sort of, sort of subtly changes, right? And that's because now this control point is controlling that area. Cool. So that's one way of refining the selection that is on our eye here, and that's by simply placing another control point. Now, move over to the right side, click on our selection. Let's take a look at what's happening here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and sort of increase and decrease our luminance. So if I wanted a more precise selection based upon our luminance value, we're gonna bring that to the right. Same thing with the chrominance. Now, of course, we're within Silver Effects Pro, but because this image was in color when we launched into Silver Effects, right? So the original photo was color, Silver Effects Pro can see and utilize that information. And therefore, um, when we're making our selections with our control points, it can make more precise control or, or selections, right? So now if we toggle our effect on and off, as I sort of shift around the control point, if we toggle that on and off, you can see the difference. I think that I've my adjustment that I've made to her eye is a little bit extreme. Um, I, I, and in fact, I think I'm gonna dial back my chrominance and my luminance and then just not brighten her eye so much. The brightening an eye is a, you know, there's a delicate balance between um, what's gonna work and then what's gonna be too much. And in fact, I think if we zoom out right now, we might all agree that uh, this is still too much um, adjustment on her eyes. Let's just take a look at that. That's not bad. If we're trying to attract the viewer's attention towards her eyes, that, that works. All right. Let's talk a little bit more. A couple of control points. Let's place a point back here in the background. I can see we're coming up on time. Time sure does fly when you're talking about control points. Um, 
let's click on this. Okay, so I place control point number five. It's making a selection of the background here. It's also kind of making more of a selection of her hair that I'm, I want. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take our um, luminance and we're gonna start to drag that to the right. You can see as our selection gets more precise, we'll do the same thing with our chrominance. Let's just drag that basically all the way to the right. And now any of our adjustments that we're making, um, it, let's say we dodge that area a little bit and add a smidge of contrast. Now we've got a little bit more separation between our subject and the background by placing that point there. We'll do a similar approach down here on her arm. So let's drop a control point on her arm just to kind of separate the skin tone of her arm from the background and from her. So we'll take this control point, place it on the back or on, on her arm. Okay, I've adjusted it. Again, I'm, I'm sort of manipulating this and adjusting it too much. You can see that uh, it did a good job to adjust her arm, but it's actually also kind of affecting the background here. So what we're gonna do is just go into our luminance slider. I'm gonna go ahead and drag that up a little bit, take our chrominance slider, drag that up a little bit, and now we've made a more refined selection, right? Now, at the beginning of the demonstration, I sort of talked about how, you know, it's great to be able to use these um, check boxes and the, to be able to look and see what the selection is doing. But once you get used to how the control points are working, I find it's just an added step to actually look. I, I find that if I just um, go in and you know make my adjustments here, and then I say, okay, well, that's adjusting her skin tone. It's not just dodging her shirt, it's dodging into her skin and somewhere, you know, some other places. Well, I'm I'm just gonna watch as I make my adjustment because it's basically happening in live action, right? If I drag these to the left, I'm gonna basically get a gradient. If I drag these to the right, I'm gonna get a more precise selection. Um, so here's another thing. If I take a control point, like let's say we, uh, we wanted kind of to lighten the center of the image entirely. We could take a control point like this, maybe enlarge it a little bit, take our color selectivity sliders all the way down, and then just go and brighten up the center. Right? This is a way to dodge the entire center of the image because our control point is going to basically just be a gradient. Right, And then if we change the size of our control point, we can change how far in or for how far out. Of course, if you take your luminance slider, you can start to make a more precise selection. But in this case here, we'll just dodge the center of the image. And now if we take a look at our before and after, we've sort of opened up some of these areas while still um, directing the viewer's attention through the image and sort of keeping true to the lighting scheme. We're not necessarily relighting the image, we're um, um, activating the lighting that's within the photo. I think I've taken this control point a little bit too far, but uh, for demonstration purposes, hopefully that's useful. Oops, wrong slider, I want this one. There you go, click the apply button. Uh, and that's that, that's utilizing control points within Silver SilverFX Pro 3. Lori, any uh, questions that are looming? Yeah, yeah, there is uh, one question here. Okay, so Vivesa and SilverFX have just the one positive control point, while ColorFX has both negative and positive control points. Can you just review how you can make a positive control point and negative? Yes, it, within, let's say, Vivesa? Sure, yes. Okay, that'd be great. Okay, yep. So, um, all right, so let's go back to this image. Let's open up Viveza. So the, the vernacular, the wording is a little bit funky because in Color Effects Pro, you, I know that's the cat, hi, hi kitty. Um, in Color Effects Pro, you're either putting a filter on an area or you're taking it off of an area, right? So you have plus and minus control points. In Viveza, you have what's called an adjustment control point. And also within Silver Effects Pro, you have what's called an adjustment control point uh, because each control point has the ability to adjust brightness, contrast, saturation, structure, so on and so forth. Now, um, the, the sort of minus control point option within Viveza or within Silver Effects Pro, let's call those constrictive control points because they're not necessarily you know, plus and minus. 
So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to just reduce the brightness um, of our sky way too far. But then if I take another control point and I just place it, let's say, like up here in the sky, watch what happens. It's it's constricting the selection that this control point is making. So, you know, we could call it a minus control point. Um, I, I try not to. I try and call it a construct a constrictive control point um, because, of course, this control point also still has the ability to adjust, you know, brightness, contrast, saturation, structure, and so on. But that's basically how you, you know, use or create a minus selection with a control point within Viveza or within Silver Effects Pro. Yeah. Hopefully that's okay. helpful. Okay. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, Dan, do you know who did the uh, the flower picture by chance? Yes. Good question. So the last portrait was by my friend David Turner. David Turner. He's a he's a fashion photographer. He also photographed the that flower. So uh, he's a he's a really amazing photographer. Um, worked for W Magazine for years and years and years. He was a uh, he's a colleague of mine at RIT, and he teaches advertising photography. Um, and speaks so beautifully and eloquently about photography. It's it's absolutely incredible. So David Turner um, made those images of the of Mabel, the last portrait, and then also the um, flower picture that we saw. If you go to his website, if you look up David Turner photography, uh, I don't know if the flower image is on his website. I don't know if that's something he's he's showing. He's he's a hobbyist photographer as well, and he likes to photograph all sorts of things. Yeah, those are beautiful. Absolutely. Very good for demoing Nick, <laughs> the Nick collection. Oh, for oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think this is actually it for now. Um, the other questions. Oh, wait, one more question. Let's take the last one from Gwen. Just popped yes. up here. Uh, do you have a workflow order that you would recommend? Yeah, basically. I'm going to click the cancel button here. Um, you know, the, the workflow depends upon the the photograph itself and what you feel needs to be done to the image. Um, personally, I like to utilize my raw processor, whether that's PhotoLab 5 or Photoshop, Adobe Camera Raw, right, or Lightroom, depending upon the images, use different raw processors. But then when you're utilizing the Nick collection, um, this Nick selective tool actually is laid out in kind of the order that's suggested, right? So um, if you have noise to reduce, maybe selectively or a massive amount of noise you want to get rid of, you do that towards the beginning of your workflow. So you'd start at the top, work your way down. The VESA is utilized for manipulating light and color, dodging and burning like we did here. Um, perspective effects also would be used very early in the workflow, maybe, maybe even before Define um, or even before VESA, depending upon you know, what makes sense to you. Um, but basically, this is the workflow, you know, from the top down, define the VESA perspective, HDR, color effects, analog, silver effects, and raw. Now, like I said, the caveat is every image is different. You're likely not using every piece of software on all of your images, but I, I frequently will use VESA and then color effects, possibly analog, and, and then silver effects pro. And I'll also even switch the order of analog and silver effects. So sometimes I'll convert an image from color to black and white using Silver Effects Pro. And then I'll use analog for maybe a, a film border or an edge or something like that. And then use the output sharpener at the very end to output for web or for a printing process. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, I think that concludes the webinar for today. Dan, thank you for going over control points in different programs. That was really helpful. Hope everybody enjoyed that, and uh, I hope that you'll join us for some more webinars. And Dan, I'll go ahead and let you close out this webinar. Ah, thank you, Lori. Thanks for joining, ladies and gentlemen. I have a great time doing these webinars, and hopefully you find these to be useful and hopefully a little bit entertaining. Um, have an absolutely wonderful Monday, the rest of your day here, and uh, enjoy your software and enjoy your photography. Thanks a lot for joining, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>